Hello, everybody. My name is Taylor Lay, and welcome, Concrete Freaky Deeks. This is a primer on hydration. We're going to try to get you some background, get you understanding, because most people I know, they get a little antsy. They get a little nervous when you start to talk about hydration. They're, they're like, oh, it's that, it's that chemistry stuff. I, I, don't, I don't know it. I, I just feel so apprehensive. It's just stuff I'm not good at. It's okay. We're going to teach it to you. You're going to learn. You're going to be ready. You're going to be a concrete hydration expert. I hope so. I hope so. That's our goal. Just a second. This is a hydration primer. Cement hydration can be a little scary for folks. I think it. one reason is that it happens at a scale we can't see. So we don't really know what goes on. We can't really understand it easily. It also involves lots of chemistry and material science stuff. And that's, again, a little scary. But don't worry. Don't worry. This lecture is designed to teach you the important information that you need to know to get you ready. It's basically going to be about terminology and then kind of explaining how that stuff works. Now, the first word that we're going to talk about today is hydrolysis. What's hydrolysis? Well, it is the breaking of chemical bonds by water. Because of charge differential. Now we're super lucky that water is something called polar. We're actually alive because of it. That's a good reason, right? to think that we're lucky. Water molecules, when you actually add them to a cup of water, if you could zoom way, way, way in, you would see that there's individual H pluses swimming around, individual OH minuses swimming around, and they're loosely related to one another, but then they move. Oh, yeah, they're like, oh, how you doing? How you doing? They moving around all the time, all the time, moving around, moving around. Now, if you took a picture, they'd be balanced. The H plus and the OH minuses would all balance each other out. But in the moments, they're moving around all over the place. So if I took something like salt and I dumped it in, it's a ionic solid. So I know this looks like a big salt crystal, but I just wanted to show you it's got Na plus and Cl minus. And I'm showing one crystal, but it's probably would be millions of smaller ones. As soon as the water sees it, it goes crazy. It goes crazy. The H plus says, oh my gosh, that chlorine, that, that CL minus looks amazing. And the OH minus says, oh, that's sodium. I need it. And they attack, they tear, they crrr, fight and break apart the salt. They break it apart. And they end up, oh, stealing the sodium over here, stealing the chlorine over here, all in these different places. And, and that's hydrolysis, this tearing, ripping. I like to explain it as like the angry horde that's tearing something apart. That's what water is. And we're lucky it's that way. Or we wouldn't be able to eat or breathe. Yeah. But it's important in hydration as well, because when you have things that are added to water, they're torn apart, and those ions are able to swim around and do different things. That's really important. Now let's talk about non-uniform reactivity. And this is where we have localized reaction
that occurs. in a material that appears uniform. It's kind of crazy, kind of puzzling. A material can look 100% uniform, but for some reason, reasons certain spots will react more than others. Why? Well, there's non-uniformity in a lot of these materials at a small scale. There may be cracks, there may be damage, there may be unique crystalline structures, okay? All these things can be the reasons. And there's a perfect example of pitting corrosion. Let's look at that now. This is a screw. A metal screw. And if this is in a corrosive environment and it starts to corrode, if you, if you could zoom in with a microscope and look at it, you would actually see that it doesn't corrode uniformly, that it only corrodes in certain spots. This is called pitting corrosion. Why does this happen? Well, non-uniformity. This localized regions have either cracks or damaged or unique structure of the metal where corrosion would rather happen there first. This is an example of non-uniformity. The next topic is called nucleation. Nucleation, what's that? It's when a chemical reaction or phase change occurs at a surface. Now, every one of these points where this nucleation happens is called... Every one of these points where this nucleation happens is called a nucleating point, okay? Or a point of nucleation. So if you've ever had water and you've tried to boil it, if you look around the sides of the pot, it starts to boil at a little bitty spot, either a little bitty speck of dust or a little bitty, little bitty divot in the side of the pot where things just aren't quite perfect. That's where these reactions like to happen, okay? It's because the surface energy there is unique and it makes it easier for them to occur at those spots. Here's an example. We've got a Sprite inside of a bottle, right? And inside that Sprite, it's got some water, it's got some dissolved carbon dioxide, right? It's a carbonated beverage. And when you open up the lid, you hear the right? It's amazing, right? And there's some CO2 gas that starts to form, right? Some little bitty bubbles start to form. But you know that not all of the bubbles come out at once. Now, actually, if you were to look at the thermodynamic equation that describes this, it should want to happen. All of that dissolved carbon dioxide wants to come out, and it wants to come out immediately. But it can't. There's an energy barrier. You could say it's shy. It needs something to, like, loosen it up. Something to make it possible. Make it seem like it's okay. It needs nucleation. It needs a point. Now, given enough time, if you leave that sprite out, all those bubbles will come out. But how long does that take? A while, right? Hours. And that's how chemical reactions typically happen. But if you have a point of nucleation, okay, if you dump in something like salt, again, we've got a salt shaker here shown dumping in some salt, that salt crystal will act as a point of supernucleation, okay? The, the 
bubbles will just start forming all around it and they'll go crazy. I know, it's awesome. I think, I think we should try it. Okay, let's do it. I've got a Sprite. I've got some salt. I'm gonna combine them together and see what happens. You start to open the Sprite. Did you hear that? It's the pressure being released. And then there's some bubbles. I hope you can see them. There's a few bubbles, and there's some that want to come out. But there's something holding them back. Some kind of energy that's holding them back. So let's kind of break that, in, that energy barrier. Let's do some salt and form nucleating points inside the Sprite. Let's see what happens. Ooh. It like totally went down my arm. That was pretty amazing and refreshing. The last topic we're gonna to talk about today is precipitation and supersaturation. This is a twofer, two at once. First one, precipitation. It's the formation of a solid, at least in this case, it's a solid, from a fluid that loses saturation. So something may become saturated, even if it's just locally, and then it may lose that saturation and form a solid. Okay? Now let's talk about supersaturation. That is when a solution dissolves or carries more material than under normal circumstances. So you could say that Sprite example was a point where the Sprite was super saturated in carbon dioxide. At least as soon as you open it, it was maybe saturated when they sealed it under pressure. But when you release the pressure, the bubbles want to come out because they're super saturated. And over time, they eventually precipitate. Bubbles precipitate, right? They form. Now let's show an, another example. If you've ever made rock candy, then you know what I'm talking about here. So if I have some water and I heat it up and I have a bag of sugar here and I just keep dumping the sugar in, I gotta, I gotta stir it, stir it, stir it, just keep dumping it in and dumping it in and stirring it, dumping it in and stirring it. And I get to the point where I'm super saturated. We're talking like crazy saturated. I'm almost making a syrup, okay? A sugar syrup. And I'm showing the thermometer over here. That's what this badly drawn thing is. You can see it's kind of high. That means it's kind of hot. Now, if we let it cool down, then actually this sugar, this is a sugar molecule here that's aqueous. That's what AQ means. It means it's dissolved in the water. Okay, it's got the water all the way around it, and it's just swimming in the water with everything else. And if I put a stick in there, the sugar is super saturated due to the high temperature. Okay, well, it's super saturated compared to room temperature. Okay, and then as this temperature starts to drop, it gets to a point where, again, 
this material wants to come out of solution. It wants to precipitate. Once it gets back to room temperature, the sugar will actually precipitate on the stick that was put inside this sugar water. And sugar may start to form around the outside, and if you let it sit there long enough and you've added enough sugar to it, the whole cup will be like a big sugar crystal. Pretty awesome, right? That is precipitation. <laughs>